start recording now, and then I'm going to pass it off to John. Great, thanks, Rebecca. All right, should be seeing my screen here. Yep. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, child care providers, people from towns, uh, whatever your place of interest in this topic that we've been involved in for quite a few years. Um, Rebecca already mentioned the groups that are presenting here, and we'll be passing this off between, uh, between us uh, presenters. Um, so the content, uh, Michael Sloan and Jessica Sabersky work for MassDEP and, and work uh, intimately with this, this program, our program manager. Julian, as noted, is from the Clean Water Trust, which has a component of, of support of, of, of work for the for, uh, controlling lead. And from UMass Amherst, I mentioned the, the, the three of us have been mentioned and we're part of a much bigger team of people working on this, uh, on this project. Um, so I'm going to just give a few slides about lead. Uh, you know, lead, it's a, it's a dangerous and toxic metal. Unfortunately, it's also over time been extremely useful metal in that it makes a very pliable, malleable, low melting point thing that we can, material we can do a lot with. When it's dissolved in water, it has no taste or odor. We've had a lot of industrial uses, uh, such as leaded gasoline, leaded paint, fortunately of which we've gotten rid of. But unfortunately, there's no, uh, no safe level of lead in uh for children. We keep finding a directive to have uh, lower and lower levels of lead that when we make measurements, we want to have no detected lead in our blood. Uh, there's no beneficial aspect for lead, unlike some materials. So it, a lot of epidemiological studies have shown that even low levels can have a negative effect on children's development. So, and uh, we want to uh, try to eliminate it from the exposure pathway uh, as best uh, we can. Um, so what are the sources? I already mentioned uh, leaded gasoline. There's leaded paint that was eliminated in the 70s, leaded gas gasoline also late late 70s, early 80s. But it also comes sometimes on, in products. It comes in uh, various materials we use in, in piping. And uh, if it gets in, in drinking water, it can be, uh, as the other sources go away, a, a, a greater and greater fraction of the total exposure. And particularly if water has got lead in it and it's used to put mixed formula for infants, it can be a very significant, as indicated here, maybe 50% of the load. Um, how does lead get in drinking water? Well, it's not in the source. It's never coming from the utility or from the, uh, almost never from the ground of a groundwater, say a household well. It comes from the materials we've used in plumbing systems, either the pipes themselves, brass faucets, uh, things like that. We're getting closer and closer to eliminating those. You can't buy materials to use in your home that have appreciable amounts of uh, lead in them anymore. But, um, but unfortunately, uh, that's only relatively recently that that has occurred. So in our buildings and materials, some of them are around for 100 years, and many of them are around for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Um, so uh, um, your water is usually supplied by a community or a public water system, so a city or town water department. And there's no required testing of each and every uh, source of that water or water from the facility. There is some limited testing as parts of other regulations, and there will be more. Um, in, uh, in, in 2024, something called the lead and copper rule revisions are happening, and uh, water utilities are going to offer testing to all elementary schools and child care facilities over a five-year period. Uh, there's testing of other schools as requested, and there, uh, we are involved with helping DEP uh, roll out that program. And DEP will assist uh, water systems to do that. Uh, but because of the interest in lead in drinking water and the concerns over it, states uh, took action uh, on their own, as, as many states have done for environmental issues. Um, and in 2016, then Governor Charlie Baker initiated a, the assistance program for lead in school and child care facility drinking water. Uh, we at UMass got involved right at the beginning. Uh, Rick and I and Kate, uh, for example, have been involved since then. And we sampled about 1,000 uh, school buildings in about 200 municipalities uh, during that uh, time period. Then uh, money was made available from the federal government, EPA, through the Water Infrastructure Improvements Act for the nation, our nation of the, for the act. And uh, we've been working at that since January 2020 
uh, with all the impacts of the pandemic, uh, et cetera, uh, that, that you all have experienced in various ways. It's a voluntary program. We do lots of different components, and we're going to describe that uh, today. DP has a lot of information for you available online. We, uh, we hold webinars like this. We distribute various kinds of information. And uh, there's also a lot of other resources that are in this, in this uh, presentation that you can download and, and get to the, the website. Um, now I'm going to turn the, the talking part over to Julian uh, Honey, who will describe a, a program that we refer to as SWIC. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for that introduction, John. And so as John noted, you know, the efforts of testing that have occurred since 2016 and through to the present day, we want to provide a solution, we want to provide an outlet, and we want to provide really funding for remediation, which is why the Trust and DEP partner to create the School Water Improvement Grants or the SWIG program. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the program overview, as well as going through the actual walkthrough of the application. Um, you can advance the slides, John. One thing I will note is so far this year, we've awarded almost $750,000 of funds, um, and we're still accepting applications on a rolling basis. So if you haven't already applied, I would encourage you to do so. But fundamentally, uh, SWIG is a very simple program. There's a testing portion, a remediation portion, and then a retesting portion. Uh, the first part of this is sampling. So you're gonna be completing water quality sampling utilizing MassDEP's LCCA tool and procedures. And I believe that Rick and Kate will be talking more about that later on in this presentation. Once you've received your results, you would be going ahead and applying to SWIG. And what you're applying for is to replace universally accessible fixtures that came back with detectable lead. At that point, once an award has been voted on by the Clean Water Trust Board of Trustees, you'd go ahead with purchasing and installing replacement fixtures. So we award $3,000 per eligible fixture, and there are some limitations on that. Um, but with those funds, there's also an expectation to complete the work in one year, and that involves procuring installment and then the retesting. And another thing to note is that grant funds are made up, uh, or sorry, are distributed at the beginning, so there's no reimbursement process at the end. As I mentioned, there's that final step of retesting and any leftover funds, once you've completed your project, can be used to purchase future replacement filters. So for round two, what types of facilities are eligible? Um, so as John had alluded to, the trust also received the WIN grant. And previously where we had only been able to offer awards to public schools, we are now able to use those funds to uh, provide grants to private schools. So eligible recipients are public and private schools K through 12, public and private early education facilities, so Head Start programs, um, you know, charter programs, things like that, and public and private non-residential daycare facilities. So at this time, really the only ineligible recipients for grant funds are family daycares. Um, but that being said, the sampling portion is still important for you folks, so I would encourage you to stick around. And to be eligible to receive grant funding, you have to have completed the water quality sampling and testing through the assistance program, or completed them using the testing procedures and ensure that they've been loaded into MassDEP's uh, program management tool and database, which is publicly accessible. So here we've got a couple examples of what kind of fixtures are eligible. Like I said already, they have to be universally accessible water fountains, chillers, or bubblers that have detectable lead. So for most cases, that's going to be hallways, libraries, cafeterias, gyms, really any area that can be uh, accessed by any students. We do allow a relocation of fixtures to maximize the use of a ball filling station. So we've had instances where there may have been a lead positive bubbler at the end of a hall that's not very trafficked by students, and you're able to take that out of a commission, cap it, and install um, that filling station maybe in the center of the hallway where it's going to get more use. Another thing to note is that facilities that care for infants, toddlers, and pre-K students, 
These can include a shared kitchen or a food prep area, uh, because we know that it's less likely there's going to be a filling station in facilities like that. And there should be a little bit more about that on the next slide. So one of the changes we made to the program is allowing the use of in classroom faucets and under sink units for those facilities that serve pre K age children and younger. Uh, there's a lot of advantages to this because we had heard from feedback of different facilities that either the overhead of installing the filling station would have been too laborious. Um, but so with this, it's in classroom water access for the children. These units are much cheaper. So while we're still awarding funds on the same level, you can um, spread that money out and maybe put more classroom replacements in and also allows to uh, retain more money for replacement of those filters in the future. So then just a brief walkthrough of the application and hopefully a few folks have already uh, completed either part one or part two, it won't be too redundant. Um, but the initial part is just a short nine question form. It's a form stack link. And truly we're just trying to gather the information for your facility and make sure that you've got testing loaded up and um, available in that portal that DEP has. If you apply and you haven't been tested yet, we would be referring you to get tested. Um, but if you did have eligible results, then you'd be sent the part two application. And that is a more uh, detailed part that is going to be showing the actual facility maps, the location codes that are being replaced. Um, as well as different enrollment data. And timeline, as far as these are concerned, we're still accepting on a rolling basis. This is that form stack I was talking about. Um, so really just collecting organization information, name, DESI code, if you're a school or your EEC code, the type of facility you are, the point of contact we're gonna be working with. And once you're able to get this into us, we are, we'll be sure to uh, return that to you in five days, whether that's progressing you to the next phase of the application or referring you to testing. And here's the facility form. Um, you can apply. So let's say you're a, a big school district. One of the biggest ones we had was Springfield. Um, you can apply for as many schools as you can complete the grant for in one year. So the packet comes with 10 facilities but you could theoretically do upwards of 10 or 20, uh, assuming you'll be able to complete those in that one year time frame. And you can go to the next page. So as far as the award process is concerned, um, I had mentioned before there's a cap on the awards. And so that cap is 100 students to one fixture, rounded up to the highest full number. Um, so let's say that you're a facility with 150 students and you had three positive fixtures, we would award a maximum of two fixture replacements, or in this case, $6,000. This is all outlined in an award letter and a grant agreement um, that establishes the timeline for the use of funds. It requires that the work meets, oh, I'm in a conference room here and I just got the light shut off on me one second. <laughs> um, Sorry about that. Um, establishes uh, the timeline for the work and it requires it to meet state and local permits. Um, it requires that the grantee certifies that the filters are gonna meet the mass DP guidelines, which at this point, all of those LK stations do. It requires that you will be completing the post installation testing. And on our end, we verify account information and we work with you throughout the process um, to make sure that you understand the requirements of the program and you feel supported. One thing I will note is with the private schools, um, we have to require you to apply for what's called a unique entity ID. Um, the federal government transitioned from using DUNS numbers to this new number to track the flow of federal funds. But uh, the feedback we've had is it's not too laborious. It just does take a couple weeks to get that number assigned. Um, so you can keep that in mind. One of the other things we'll do is we have a grant questionnaire which collects the info. So then the post award, you've received the funds. Now you're going to go through procurement. Um, so any public facilities and districts can use the Combi's state contract or the OSD's um, FAC 100, which is building maintenance repair. 
operation projects materials, whereas private facilities and private guarantees have to collect detailed and itemized quotes for procured units and the cost of installation. Uh, we have created a procurement guide and a procurement guidance document, um, sort of like a bid log and all the things that you have to make sure you're ticking the right boxes for those private facilities. And that's something we'll be able to provide to you once you have an award voted. Um, so it should be as straightforward as possible. And then finally, there's the project closeout and use of funds. So throughout this process, we're going to assist whether it's questions about eligible bids, about um, any advice we can provide as far as types of filling stations or how to put them, um, sorry, excuse me, where to put them. We will send grant closeout notifications um, for six and nine months after funds are dispersed. We on ourselves provide quarterly reports to the EPA for ESWIG, as well as to our board of trustees. We monitor those that are being closed out and we'll continue to answer questions. Um, as far as the eligible use of funds, it can be used to purchase the unit themselves. It can be used for labor costs. And if you have in-house plumbing, um, that's not a problem. It can be used to purchase future filters, purchase retests, and again, retaining those surplus funds for any other future operations and maintenance related to the filling stations. My contact info is on here, um, as is my colleague Jonathan Maples, who's not with us today, but did create this program. And our websites and Twitter accounts are linked. And the following slide contains the information for the part one application. Um, so if you have completed testing, you could go ahead and uh, fill out that part one application. If you haven't completed it, you, you know, feel free as well, but we will just be referring you to the uh, expanded assistance program to get tested. And with that, I believe we have a poll, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Has your facility had sampling analysis for lead outside of the Mass DEP program? More seconds. About half the people voted so far. I think that's it. I'll share the results. Uh, let's see. Well, there's kind of a good split. Forty percent said no. 40% said, I don't know, and we had 20% that said yes. I'm going to do one more poll. Has your facility participated in the Mass DEP Voluntary Assistance Program? Everyone was a little quicker in voting this time. Everyone, um, same same kind of split. Forty percent said no. Forty percent said I don't know. Um, ten percent said yes, and then there is a small ten percent that just the question did not apply to them. All right, um, on to the next. So I'll pass off the presentation to Rick Larson, who will tell a little bit about, uh, and Kate will tell about some of these components of the EAP program. Good Thank morning. You. Good morning. Um, you can apply for the assistance program online. Uh, there'll be links uh, on this program. Uh, and once you uh, complete that application, uh, you will wind up getting a phone call from a technical assistance provider like Kate Gallagher. We have uh, several others, or you might even get one from me. Um, when we call you, we try to determine the size of your facility. And uh, we generally, if, if you're a school in, in a school type building, 
uh, we'll request a map, which uh, usually works best with the uh, fire evacuation map on the uh, walls of every school classroom, uh, where uh, you are d directed to the fastest way to get out of the building in case of a fire. Uh, generally, we take that map, it's a plan view map, in other words, from the top down, and we ask you to mark where the uh, individual water fixtures are that we need to test. And those could be sinks, uh, water fountains, water coolers, uh, the old porcelain uh, fountains on the wall, uh, and um, anything that's potable water, uh, short of using uh, bathrooms or um, uh, slop sinks that the janitor uses. Uh, if kids are brushing their teeth in a bathroom sink, we will test those. Uh, so on the fixture map, we take that and we organize the uh, order in which to collect the samples. Uh, if, if you're a large school, there's uh, a number of samples that we'll organize in, in a specific order so that uh, you're not affecting any upstream samples when you're collecting them. Uh, and uh, after that, we will uh, order sample bottles and uh, develop a chain of custody for you, which is a legal document, which will um, ensure the integrity of the samples after the sampler collects them and uh, delivers them to a laboratory. And they could either deliver them in person, use a laboratory courier, or uh, a delivery system like FedEx or UPS. So you'll collect the samples, fill out the chain of custody, which uh, uh, Kate will discuss in detail, uh, and deliver the samples to a laboratory, and they will be tested for total lead. Uh, the laboratory fees and the delivery will be paid for by uh, MassDEP and UMass and uh, the lab results will be reported electronically to DEP to the schools and eventually they will be available through the pub to the public on a an online portal uh, and then if uh, depending on the results the uh, 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 the public will be able to see I mean, the public will be able to see them in any event uh, but if there's communication concerning uh, what should be done about problem fixtures, uh, you will get that in writing. Uh, and uh, there may be remediation needed, or you may just have to secure the fixture. In other words, shut it off, disconnect it, whatever. You will be sent a certificate of completion from the program. Uh, and if you are uh, eligible, you will get a Brita pictures uh, with filters on them, which will take the lead out uh, if uh, it's determined that uh, you have significant amount of lead to, to remove. And that is any detectable lead. Next slide. Okay, the online application form link is right there. Uh, and then you fill it out. We have them available in English and Spanish. Uh, and you'll be providing information as to uh, how to get in touch and where you're located and uh, what kind of facility you have, whether it's a large uh, daycare or smaller daycare or a family child care. Uh, we uh, have that information saved in the database. And, um, and that is uh, for future use. If, if you want to test again at your own expense, you can do that. And as long as you use our chain of custody, uh, those results will go into the database. Um, okay, th these are just uh, examples of the uh, forms that you'll be filling out online. Next. Uh, this is Spanish uh, forms. Uh, the initial outreach from the program will be from the technical assistance provider. We have a number of them, and their names are up there. Uh, they will try to determine the extent of sampling that you've got to do, and uh, they will explain it either over the phone or come and visit and do what we call a walkthrough if the school is large enough. 
uh, and uh, determine the order that the sample will be collected. Um, and during the outreach, we'll ask the uh, provider uh, um, certain information as far as the location of all your fixtures uh, and who supplies you with the water. Uh, this is just the example of a school evacuation plan, which I uh, don't even try to read the black and white part of the map because uh, it's just too small. Uh, but that's that shows a number of uh, fixtures on the plan uh, for a fairly good sized school. Um, let's see. These are examples of uh, sinks uh, that can be tested. Uh, whether you're in a, a formal classroom or a, a room such as this one uh, where there's uh, food being served and that sort of stuff. Uh, we have a database called the uh, Program Management Tool for the LCCA program. It's web-based and uh, you can access it online if you find a need. Uh, the technical assistance provider will uh, set it all up uh, and the functions of the tool uh, allow you to enter and create the sample location for each fixture that's tested and uh, recorded on the sampling plan. Uh, you can download the chain of custody, bottle labels, uh, and the sampling plan from this tool. Uh, you can upload documents to uh, have a historical record of the map and the field chain of custody. The field chain of custody is what the laboratory sends us after the uh, samples are received and they uh, designate uh, laboratory numbers on each one. Uh, and uh, the sample results will be viewable in the uh, management tool as well. And if uh, the results require that you uh, have to do remediation or disconnect uh, fixtures, that will be noted in the management tool as well. Uh, each facility or school system has its own PIN code. It's a 12-character code, uh, which is unique to the school system or to the uh, facility. And that will allow you access into the management tool. And that's the front page of the management tool right there and that PIN code will be uh, entered into those three boxes. Okay, uh, uh, I think the rest of this is going to be covered by Kate. Yes, pass off to Kate. Thanks, Rick. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Kate. I am a technical assistance provider with UMass, and I get to go over how to collect the water samples with you. And um, it's pretty straightforward. But as noted earlier, before collection can take place at your facility, we do need sample plans um, and maps, basically where we're going to collect from. The technical assistance provider creates labels and a chain of custody form from your map or sample plan and then um, helps you through the process. Once bottles are secured um, from the lab that's assigned to your facility, Sampling can be scheduled. Next, please. So sampling must take place under actual conditions. Um, we do have a stagnation period that needs to occur right before sample collection. This stagnation period is um, 8 to 18 hours, 8 being the most appropriate, which is just simply overnight. So oftentimes samples are collected first thing in the morning, right before the facility opens um, and before anybody actually uses the water. Uh, there's two samples that are collected from each fixture or location. There's a primary sample, which is the first draw. It focuses on what's um, coming out of the fixture itself. Um, and then there's a, a 30 second flush or we let the water run for 30 seconds. And the second sample there is called a flush sample. The flush sample sort of checks if there's elevated lead concentrations further down in the plumbing system. And um, just to note, you shouldn't clean any screens or aerators for this program. We're looking for actual conditions. Next, please. What is needed 
are the sample bottles which the tap should coordinate to either get to your facility or bring physically to your facility. I use a clipboard, a pen, and I use my cell phone to, to uh, time the 30 second flush. I also use a magic marker. And then of course the chain of custody form, like Rick said earlier, please use ours. And then labels um, for the bottles. Next please. So um, again, the the protocol is a primary and a flush sample for each location. It's really simple. And once you get that down, it's a primary and a flush for each location. So the protocol doesn't change. So if you can do the first one, you can do every one after that. You collect the water sample, write down what time it is on the chain of custody and the label, affix the label and move on to the next. Next slide, please. This is an example of our, the labels that we use. Note it has the school facility name and the organizational code. That's so the, if the lab isolates a sample, it can always be brought back to the specific facility it came from. Next, please. The chain of custody is a legal document that basically attests to the sample being taken as we said it was when we wrote it down. Um, <clears throat> one should always use ours, LCCA specific chain of custody so that your results get uploaded to the tool and are easily accessible by you later on. Uh, <laughs> that was a cute picture. Um, we do request that it includes the organizational org code and this is just a copy of a typical chain of custody for like a family facility with two locations. Uh, that's is too small for me to see if you're pointing that out, John. But um, this information is automatically propagated in the management tool. You should know that client is UMass, bubble one basically is who's the client? Well, that would be us, UMass. Bubble two is where the sampler's name goes um, and then their initials. And bubble three is where we record the time the sample was taken. So if I took samples yesterday morning at seven o'clock, I would write seven o'clock and then initial it. Uh, the blue arrow is where I put the date so I don't have to rewrite the date in that small box that's bubble three. And next slide. The bottom of the chain of custody, we do have to relinquish the um, samples when we send them off. I FedEx samples all the time, so I'm relinquishing them myself. Uh, one last little thing on the chain. Some of the bigger facilities can have several pages, so I always number them. And next, please. Uh, sometimes we have what's called divergent piping, and so the protocol changes just a little bit where you have one main pipe that leads to the wall and then two that diverge off of it, like the scenario on the left. I would only need a primary from each of those locations and then one flush because it's the same pipe being flushed. The same with the scenario on the right with the gooseneck and the bubbler at one classroom faucet. Those come from the same main pipe, so we only need to flush it once. Next. Um, so you were told earlier by Julian what we're sampling, but let me just show you a few pictures here. There's a hallway cooler or water chiller unit on the left, and then that's a nurse's office sink. They're usually tinier than classroom faucets. And of course, the classroom faucet or teacher's lounge sink or what looks like a regular kitchen sink with a sprayer and a bubbler. And, and the main faucet itself. Again, those three, if you looked at that picture and you were going to do all three, for the most part, they're PF scenarios. Possibly the last one, if you're going to include the sprayer, would be PPPF with the three divergencies there. Next slide, please. A water bottle filling station can still be. Um, collected from, and because it's of the same source, we'd only need one primary and um, for the bottle fill and a primary and a flush for the bubbler. 
that's in the front right hand corner if you can see that next slide please So we do not normally collect from certain areas like a slop sink or a custodial washing sink. Bathroom sinks, I, um, I request best practice is that we post for hand washing only in bathrooms um, so that your students or your clients know that we're not expecting you to drink from the bathroom's faucets. And I use the same best practices in chemistry labs and art rooms. If it's posted not for drinking water, then we wouldn't collect from there. Next slide, please. So a larger facility, the lab will sometimes pick up your samples. Due to the pandemic, they kind of stopped doing this. I've been carting samples to the lab directly or FedExing them for smaller facilities. If you have a larger facility, then uh, we could possibly arrange for pickup still. Um, it depends on the lab too. Sometimes they deliver in a cooler and pick up in that same cooler. But you don't you don't have to refrigerate your samples. There's no special treatment. They just are only viable for 28 days. Next please. So sometimes there's things that go wrong and we just maintain not to stress or freak out. If you miss something in the sample plan so it's not on the chain of custody we simply add it to the end of the chain of custody we don't skip it in the field if we catch it um, <clears throat> sometimes we miss that divergent piping like i was talking about earlier and that can be hard to get correct into the chain of custody because it's automatically populated and so we'll add that scenario to the bottom of the chain like that extra flush or whatever it is. Um, if a sampling location that's in the plan and on the chain is actually inaccessible or has been shut off, we just simply draw a line through it, not in use, and we note it as not in use or inaccessible. And if you've run out of bottles, please, please contact me right away so I can try and get you uh, more bottles as soon as possible. And I think that's it for me. The next slide, please, if there is one. Okay, so. Um, yeah, that, yeah. Kate, you're correct. Yeah, I'm going to pick up from here and uh, just share okay. a little. Thank you, Kate, for all that stuff about uh, about uh, sample uh, collection. There's a lot uh, involved there. And uh, the ultimate goal, of course, is to get results. So. Uh, the labs are certified by MassDEP, and they upload the results uh, electronically. And uh, the analytical results, a, a file, we'll show you some of these, get mailed to different uh, entities. Uh, this may, we, 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 some of these are directly and some of these are indirectly, but lots of uh, entities want to be involved. Largely the school, uh, MassDEP, uh, Department of Public Health follows up, and uh, eventually, the, as Rick noted, the the results show up on something called the EEA uh, portal, which everybody can look at. And if you looked at it, you would find as many as a couple hundred thousand lines of results for all the schools and child care facilities in Massachusetts since they started doing this. Um, then um, uh, this is an example of results that we send out, tells you when the work was done. Uh, what lab did it, who collected the samples, and then we have a location ID, what it was, here's a sink, uh, whether it was non-detectable, below below one, uh, maybe detectable but very low, and if it's a little bit higher, between one and a half and 15, it's one color, and if it's greater than 15, it's another color, and oftentimes we have flush samples that are non-detected, so you can see that. So what did we find? Back in uh, the first round of the program, about 1,000 facilities, turns out that almost every building, like 90, 90 something percent of buildings have at least one sample where lead is detected. It's very uncommon, uh, are not very common with, with, with to find a building with one, with at least one. But on the other hand, almost all individual samples have low lead levels. 48% of the first draw samples were less than one and 68% of the flush samples were less than one. So most samples are low, but most buildings it's common to have something that has a detection. 
The expanded assistance program has been running since 2020, and we've got uh, results for over we're between 400 and 500 uh, facilities. Um, we had uh, excellent, what I think is excellent, where in fact we have 31% of the facilities have first draw and flush samples at non-detect. That's excellent. So the first program was mostly schools. Now we have a lot of uh, early education care facilities, smaller, newer facilities in some cases that can do this. And then if we go to the flush samples, all the flush samples that we collect of those 261 facilities or 61% of the all the facilities had all the flesh samples at uh, one ppv or less so essentially non-detectable lead so that's great so one of the things that we uh, uh stress is the benefit of flushing it's a short-term benefit and you need to do it every time but it is a benefit uh so we 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 communicate with the systems we stress that the system should communicate facilities with your parents your students uh, uh et cetera, staff uh, letters, other kinds of communication that we have examples of, and uh, those tools are, are shown here, and fact sheets from DPH. Um, so another thing, what about remediation? So a couple different slides here on that. We, we shut off problem fixtures that are uh, 15 or parts uh, per million or greater. We can implement a flushing program. We recommend that. Conduct the outreach and uh, determine if the source is the fixture or the plumbing, might be able to replace the fixture or replace plumbing, and installing point of use uh, lead removal treatment from through the screen program is a really great thing to do. Follow up and develop a plan to create solutions. So this is one kind of chart that MassDEP has for follow up actions, the things that I mentioned, and this is another uh, document that's available online from DEP that talks about what we do for these different levels of uh, lead that may be detected in these samples. Um, here's an example, this was early on from Amherst, Massachusetts here. The old school fixtures were on the left and they were replaced by new ones that meet a standard to be essentially lead free. Um, it's not quite 100%, but it's so much better than what it was in the past. Uh, some of these fixtures show copper pipe with lead with solder that may have contained lead in it prior to 1986. So, best is to eliminate the plumbing uh, that has that. Um, it's important that the public water system provide water that's as uh, uncorrosive or not corrosive as possible, and, and water systems are required to do that. But if there's lead in fixtures and plumbing, it's almost impossible to not have detectable lead, no matter what you do. So the best thing is to remove the facilities, the, the, the units that have lead. Uh, down below, I mentioned here point of use treatment, the SWIG grant for bottle fill. Julian mentioned undersink filters for the pre-K programs. And we are also giving uh, Brita filters that were donated from Brita uh, in, in our program. And also there's, there's the refrigerator filters. So um, uh, with that, we have time. Uh, to take some questions. I'll leave this slide up, uh, enter questions in the chat, and Rebecca will moderate the, the, the asking of questions, and then between Rick and Kate and I and Julian, we'll try to answer. So thanks for listening. Everyone, <clears throat> oh, my voice. Um, thank you to all the presenters. We don't have any questions in the chat yet. Um, ah. If anybody would like to... Um, ask their question, you know, not have to write it out. Um, just let me know. Just write in the chat. I want to, I want to answer. I suppose I could just turn the unmuting ability off. Um, we'll, we'll give it a try. I might regret this later, but yeah. I think everyone should be muted. So if anyone would like to unmute. At this if time, anybody would, we're happy to Try to take any questions if anybody would like to do that. But if if not, um, I want to stress again: we've got our techno systems providers. You know, email, call, text. Uh, we interact in various ways, and uh, we do have um, both English and, and uh, Spanish uh, speaking providers. So uh, got a lot of a lot of, we try to help uh, in every way we can. Um, to facilitate the, the testing of uh, particularly, as I say, the focus is on the uh, early education and childcare facilities uh, 
which is where it should be. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll offer the same for the SWAG program. Um, very open communication. So yeah. even if you, you know, there, there is no bad questions or um, if anything comes up, you can always reach out to myself. Yeah. Okay. So no one has questions today, but if in a couple of weeks you think of it, um, yeah. go back and either find your PDF if you saved it, you have everybody's contact information, or go back to the email that was the reminder to join this session, you know, the one hour before reminder email. You're also going to follow up email. Go back to that email and just reply to the email. It'll go to me and I can contact you with any of these people. Let's see, we have a chat question. It does not look like anyone on Martha's Vineyard has participated, is uh, from John Collins. Um, boy, Rick is probably the one uh, to answer that because he has the best memory of where we have, have and have not been. It depends what uh, participants. We started in 2016. I feel like we did some work on Martha's Vineyard, but I, I can't quite remember. Rick, you're muted. Yeah, yeah we did. Uh, uh, Gene's been out there at least twice to uh, uh, collect yeah. from a couple of schools. And yeah. uh, we, we did one almost two years ago, which seemed to be a brand new school uh, or yeah. uh, a child care facility that uh, we did. And uh, that was completely non-tech. Well, that's what happens when you build them new. So, yeah. um, there is, I should get the link. There is a story map that shows uh, the participation that DEP has prepared that you can look by community and see if <coughs> which facilities have, have participated in different parts of the program. And I will try to provide that link to Rebecca uh, so she can send it to you all. We should include that in, I think. Oh. Maybe. Oh, Julian's got it. Okay. In the chat. Cool. Yep. Um, also put it in the materials list so that when you get your follow-up email, which will be in about an hour, you'll have access to that. So you don't have to just save it right now. Right. It'll kind of be emailed. Rebecca, it looked like someone had a question about available offline and you've answered that, I think. Yes. Right. We're gonna... Yeah. So I'm recording this session right now. Um, and I'll, you know, hand it off, whether it, it'll get posted or not, I'm not sure. We've done this session a few times. But if you just email me directly and ask for the link, I can just email you, um, any of the participants. That way, if it does not make it up onto a UMass or a DEP site or a YouTube channel, which it might not, um, just um, respond to that reminder email that you got an hour before the session, which was, comes from me, Rebecca Novak. Just send me an email and ask me to share you the, the link. I don't know if my screen is still being shared. I just went on the it's link this. and I'm, I'm showing this map that uh, that's the story map that shows you can hover over a community and find out what's uh, what's been what's been done. So and I apologize. When... I confused Nantucket with Martha's Vineyard. The, uh, ah, the child okay. care I was thinking of was in Nantucket. But we do have some of each. Uh, yeah, I was just looking at the results. It looks like there's some schools in Edgartown that were tested back in 2016. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so this uh, story map can uh, be, you know, take, be used to look at things. And there's a lot of other links and stuff on this uh, this site as well which there's links through the DEP website on uh, assistance program for lead in school, EECF, drinking water. There's quite a lot of things. Okay, looks like that's it for questions. I've uploaded that link into the materials list so you'll have it in your follow-up email. Great. Great. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Thanks to everyone. the presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.